Welcome to our uh, third Climate People Environment Program Seminar this semester. The organizer here is CCR and AOS, and it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Professor Joel Chang uh, from the Department of Biological Systems Engineering. So, uh, a relatively new arrival, PWM, in a few years. And so, uh, exciting to always uh, be able to connect new faculty with some of the work that's going on across. And hopefully, we'll learn a bit about your work. Uh, just to give some background. Um, she has a, a bachelor's degree in, uh, from Beihan University in astronautics engineering. Yeah. So she was thinking about space science. Uh, so, um, a master's then in instrumentation science and optoelectronics. And then she came to the US at Purdue University where she did her PhD in civil engineering. Her work spans a variety of remote sensing data fusion and machine learning uh, techniques that focus on uh, precision agriculture. Learn more about it today, and of course, as you know, our tradition has been to have a reception after the talk. And so, again, we will be uh, meeting over to set a few minutes or so after the uh, seminar ends. And there is free cheese and potentially other things uh, of your interest. And so, please do come and hang out if you want to ask questions and follow up more. We'll have some time in the end, of course, for questions. And our tradition also is that we do try to prioritize the first guests questions from students or early career researchers to the extent we can, but so please do speak up and ask questions, especially for the students, uh, but not a hard pass role, but, uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Joe. I joined the department of BSE this March. So uh, here is our uh, digital ag research website, so if you want to learn more about the details for uh, works I'm currently working on, you can go to check the website. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, AI in uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, specifically, I will just give a few examples to see how this artificial intelligence like uh, remote sensing machine learning can be applied for our agricultural applications. A little bit more details about myself. So I came to U.S. since 2013, and I did my PhD at Purdue University, has a major in civil engineering and also minor in computational science and engineering. For my dissertation, most, mostly focuses on the machine learning theory part. I developed like novel machine learning algorithm specifically to deal with the hyperspectral image data. At the meantime, I also get involved in this high throughput plant phenotyping project. Um, using multi-source remote sensing data and machine learning. I think this is a pretty good example to see how this AI can be applied for agriculture. So I will give uh, more details for this example later. And after my PhD, I went to University of California, Davis for a postdoc. At that time, I also developed machine learning algorithm for the l mountain yield prediction for the purpose of natural resource management. Now I have several, at BIC department, I have several different projects uh, going on and then I will talk uh, about them at the end. So in general, my research is kind of uh, interdisciplinary. It's like my background. I have different majors from my bachelor, master, and PhD. So one part of my uh, research focuses on collecting and gathering this multi-source remote sensing data from different platforms. We can get this satellite data, we can uh, access to the public available satellite data, but at, we can also mount our own sensors on the like uh, ground-based vehicles and also the uh, urban area vehicles to collect the finer spatial resolution data. Uh, another part of my research focuses on developing the machine learning algorithm to uh, make more efficient use of this such a multi-source big data set. At the end, I want to combine these two pieces together to support sustainable agriculture for different agricultural applications. I will give some uh, examples. So sustainable agriculture, I think, usually requires intensive data collection and processing. So <coughs> uh, for example, we can use the hyperspectral, the spectral data, multispectral, hyperspectral data to, to monitor the crop 
girls' health care conditions at a regular timely basis. And also we can use this LiDAR data to derive the plant heights and some uh, climate data to help uh, monitor the local uh, plant conditions. At the end, ultimately, we want to combine all this data together. They can give us the complementary information to help growers, farmers make a more, uh, um, to make the final decision. If they can be served as a decision tool, make recommendations with uh, resource management, as such. So first of all, for sustainable agriculture, one direction we can go is to exploring this kind of uh, new uh, renewable resources, such as biofuel. Now I'm going to talk about the example of uh, the, the work I did at Purdue. This project was founded by uh, DOE, RE, and it's for sorghum uh, phenotyping. So uh, we know that sorghum is a very important biofuel crop. Uh, but the best varieties for the biofuel production are not well studied. This question can be answered by associating the genotypes with the sorghum different phenotypes. But the bottleneck here is to how to get all this phenotype data. We can send a bunch of people to the field to collect using the hand measurements to collect such different phenotypes, like a plant height, leaf chlorophyll content, yield, biomass, and other interesting agronomic traits. But we know this is very time consuming and labor intensive. Then recently, uh, this high throughput imaging based phenotyping um, work has become very, approach has become very popular. So here is the flow chart. Like at the beginning, we can mount different sensors on different platforms, like the ground based vehicle and also the drones to collect such different multi sensor data. And then we do some pre-processing to uh, get this big remote sensing data sets. And then we develop machine learning models to predict these different phenotypes. With these phenotypes, then they can be connected with the genomic data for the genetic analysis. Finally, the variety with those uh, desired phenotypic traits can be selected. Here are the sensors we used in that project, including the traditional RGB, LiDAR, hyperspectral, and thermal. Of course, we also need a GPS IMU system, navigation system to, for data georeferencing. Two different platforms were used. One is the Ironman area vehicle, another is this big phenol rover. Different sensors were mounted on the front boom. Here is a zoom in picture. You can see more clear about different sensors are mounted here. And in the middle, there's a GPS system to, to just to reference different sensors. Here is the, how these systems talk to each other, communicate with each other. I was mostly focusing on uh, developing this UAV based hyperspectral system to collect and process the hyperspectral data. Uh, we know that hyperspectral can give us more detailed spectral information, so they are extremely helpful for the crops and forest. But the problem for hyperspectral data is that it's a line camera, it's not like a free camera. Uh, at each data acquisition time, only one line data can be collected. But we want to have all these lines data line up well, so we need to, there's a big issue for the uh, geometric correction for those in order to make those lines line up well. We mounted a high performance GPS IMU navigation system. Right here is the camera, right attached to the camera. So the system can provide a, a high resolution at location and actual information for the image. And using that information, we can do the geometric correction. So here, this is one path over the field, sort of field. At the top, you can see before doing any geometric correction, we have some uh, geometry arrows for the rows, the plants, and then after the geometric correction, the, all the arrows are corrected. And this is only one path. The drone was flagged flag um, multiple paths over one field, and then we can mosaic all the passes, put all the passes together by using such GPS information, then we can get a nice, neat, clean uh, mosaic data covering the entire field. This is the example like how we pre-process uh, pre such data. 
We can have RGB, LiDAR, hyperspectral covering different uh, wavelengths. Right? Now we have this data ready, then we need to extract information from this data and develop models for uh, phenotypic trees prediction. This is a study area. It's a, a relatively small area. We want to firstly test out if the sensor data are good and also if the algorithm are, uh, uh, can give us something. So in this field, we 18 different genotypes of plantain with two densities and four replications for each. And the color, different colors represent for uh, different genotypes. The three band RGB high resolution imagery were collected. So it can give us like a better than one centimeter spatial resolution. Over the growing season, we collect data almost weekly or bi weekly over the growing season. And then, um, so you can see the as the time goes, the, the uh, more leaves come out and also the chemicals come out. The important phenotypes like the leaf counts, chemical counts, and canopy cover can be definitely derived from such high resolution RGB imagery. Uh, one important uh, trait is the plant height. This can be derived from the RGB imagery by using the 3D reconstruction. Here are the uh, heat maps generated for the sorghum experimental field. One was from the July and another was from uh, August. In August, the, 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 the plants get higher, and even for different, within the same field, for different plots, they have different heights. Then the high histograms can be extracted within each plot. For different uh, types of sorghums, like green sorghum or the flowery sorghum, the high histogram look differently. And also, even for the same genotype, the variety, the different density have different this kind of uh, high histograms. So they can be used like a very informative, distinctive features and incorporate that into the model. Another thing is this hyperspectral data. It gives us like two uh, nanometer spectral resolution give us more than 270 spectral bands covering the visible and the near infrared range. So for each plot, I firstly just calculated the mean spectrum for within each plot to represent the plot level information. And I combine all these features into a machine learning model to firstly predict the stock diameter and the dry biomass. Here is the prediction accuracy. For the dry biomass, the accuracy can achieve higher than 0.7 R square. And uh, I didn't have the results here, but this is for the one time point results. But if we combine the time series data, the, uh, the accuracy can, can be improved. So that's the uh, one thing I thought as uh, how we apply AI in agriculture. Another thing, an example I want to talk about is this resource management. Because we want to use, uh, make more efficient use, like less water, less nitrogen, but we don't want to lose the yield. Um, this is one example. This is the project I work on when I was a postdoc at the University of California, Davis. I developed a machine learning model to predict the end of season yield uh, at a early season time. The album typically harvested in end of August, early September, but we want to know the yield like in February and March. So based on this yield information, uh, they can be incorporated to, into a nitrogen fertilizer calculator, and the growers will be able to use such information to manage their nitrogen. Also, another thing is like Elmont is perennial crop. The yield changes by year and by location. We want to know what are the main drivers for uh, for explaining such variation. <clears throat> this is the uh, framework for this work. We collaborate closely with the local Elmont growers. 
They send us the field level data information like historical use, planting density, tree age, and uh, we also can access to the public available climate data and uh, land set resources inventory. We develop a predictive model to firstly predict the end of season yield in early season in March and also extract the important features from the model to help explain the spatial and the temporal yield variation. This is our study area. The Central Valley of California is a very productive region and the uh, Elmont is distributed across the whole entire central valley, including the north, middle, and south region. So we can see that the south region has higher temperature than the north, but less precipitation. Later we found that this climate difference actually can help explain why the south region has higher yield than the north region. To develop model, first thing is always to gather the input variables. Like for Elmond, it's perennial. Uh, the trees tend to grow fastly before like seven years old, so the yield tends to keep increasing firstly. And after like seven years old, uh, after 20 years old, the trees are just pretty old, the yield tends to decrease. And during this uh, winter, uh, from seven, like, 20 years old, then the yield just uh, varies by year, probably due to the climate, uh, <coughs> different climate. Um, so the uh, tree age and the historical use are super important for the model development. We extract such variables and incorporate them into the model. And along with the monthly and seasonal temperature precipitation. Another important climate variable is the winter chilling hours. Uh, the trees need to get enough winter chill so the, uh, they can be ready for blooming. And an easy way to calculate such winter chilling hours to get the local station weather, or use the local station to count accumulated hours within that range from November to February. And also there are more advanced like dynamic model can also be used here. I just present this easy one. And then for El for different uh, nut trees, they require different winter chill, but for Elmont, it's like they require about 500 hours. After the winter dormancy, the trees start to bloom, and this is important for the bee pollination. <coughs> we want to develop a bloom index to quantify the bloom intensity. Here are the remote sensing data, like in the middle of February, the trees are still green. So the blue index intensity has to be low. And uh, as time goes, you can see at early, late February or early March, the, 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 the tree starts bloom and the intensity has to be higher. Even within each orchard, it's for some trees, some rows, they have higher uh, bloom intensity, but for other rows, they have lower. So they are different. This can uh, also be an important, strong indicator can be used into the model for the prediction. I used the gradient boosting tree model for this yield prediction and found that the South region, the Southern California has higher yield, you can see that, has higher yield than the North. And one reason I think is probably because of the warmer temperature, it can help nuts getting mature. And the, the input variables were ranked based on their importance, like the most important one are the last two years yield. This is probably because the Elbond is like an alternative bearing crop. So if the last year's yield tends to be higher, then this year's yield tends to be lower. And the, the vegetation indexes from landsat data are important. One thing I want to mention is the precipitation during the February and March, which is the blooming period. And it's, we found that it's negatively, you can see the plot here, we found that it's negatively correlated to the yield. Which I think is probably because if too much rainfall can reduce the bee activity and lower the pollination and then lower the yield. For the age, this is the partial dependence plot. Uh, 
before getting like seven or eight years old, the yields just has to increase, and after a certain years, then the yield has to increase. Here are some two examples that how this such remote sensing and machine learning techniques can be applied in agriculture. On the other hand, I also worked on developing the machine learning algorithms to to deal with the general problems. Let's say uh, for different problems, but we also we always want to gather data from different sensors, and also or for each sensor we want to extract different types of features, or we can say we want to get this time series data. In any case, all this, by combining all these data together, it can result in a very super big data set, and the dimensionality tends to be super high. And some features are highly correlated and then redundant. We want to reduce the computational load without uh, uh, sacrificing the model accuracy. Then I developed some uh, feature extraction strategies to handle this multi model data sets. Another common problem for any model development is like we always need ground truth data to develop the model. But the ground truth data, especially in the agriculture applications, is always limited. We need to send people out to collect such information. It's limited. And such limited data may not properly represent the data distribution and can degrade the model performance. So I propose several active learning based sampling strategy to make full use of the limited training data. Yeah, here's just an example to explain what does feature extraction mean. So let's say we probably have two of these days different uh, points, different color represents for different, uh, you can say, classes, and we want to separate them. We can either project in this way or in that way, but obviously this way is very bad, but that's the best way we can project to separate the data. And meanwhile, we reduce the dimensionality from two to one. So in the real case, we have this super high dimensional data, say, or we collect hyperspectral data weekly, in each week we get 200 dimensions. If we want to combine this weekly data, we have, can have thousands of dimensions. But we treat each time point as one data source. <coughs> and then we, again, we want to distinguish different types of things. Uh, we want to put similar things together, but dissimilar things far apart. And then we can divide some optimization uh, objective function for such purpose by using like a projection matrix. If we can constrain this matrix to be rectangular, we can just manually set the uh, dimensionality. We can reduce dimensionality from 200 to 7. Then later we have all these different data sources. They can either come in from different sensors, different times, or the same sensor, different types of features. And then we change the objective function to incorporate such multi-source data in to just to optimize this. And then we learn, we jointly learn this uh, projection matrix devoting to each specific source. Then we will be able to reduce the dimensionality for each data source. That's for the feature. That's just one example we I developed to to for, to handle the high dimensionality issue. Another thing I work with is about this active learning approach to uh, to use as few training data, from truth data as possible, but don't sacrifice the prediction accuracy. That's the goal. So what we mostly do is this passive learning. We have this wrong truth data. We randomly separate them into training data and testing data. Random. And during the process, the model does not talk to the training data. They, they, they don't collect any feedback from the model. Or in the other way, we can just think uh, the model actually can give us some uh, feedback to the, we can select which are the most informative samples and then add them into the training data pool. So at the end, uh, active learning tends to give higher accuracy than this randomly sampling passive learning strategy, but or we can say to achieve the same accuracy, we can use much less, much fewer data points than the passive learning. That's the goal 
this active learning. I think this can be super helpful in the agriculture applications. So I'm working towards this direction. Oh yeah, then later I combine these two pieces together into one framework. So I will be able to handle these two major issues in one machine learning model. <coughs> then I tested out my algorithm on a crop mapping application. This is a public available hyperspectral data set. It covers different, 16 different types of crops. Um, it has 200, more than 200 spectral bands. Firstly, I extracted, based on this data set, I extracted three types of features. One is the commonly used the spectral features, but the, the crops tend to look similar to each other. The spectral features could not uh, distinguish them very well. And I also tracked the uh, texture features, morphological features from the same data set. Now I have like these three data sources. Then the algorithm was applied on this data set uh, the last one is the classification map I got, and here's the ground truth map. We just compare different uh, algorithm with the ground truth. So we can see that one is less noisy and more looks more similar to, to this one. Oh. So here is just a summary for what I did before. I tend to combine this remote sensing and predictive modeling for different <coughs> agriculture applications. That's more application oriented. On the other hand, I'm also interested in just developing the machine learning algorithm to handle this uh, common problem. And this algorithm can be applied to just different applications. Uh, that's all past. So now I want to talk about what I have been working on since I joined the department. I have been here for like half a year, so first thing I want to do is just to continue working on this UAV-based uh, plant phenotyping work. I integrated this UAV-based hyperspectral system. This is the system I have now. This is M600 UAV, and here is a gimbal just to stabilize the camera, to make sure the geometry is good, and that's the uh, Hyrule Nano hyperspectral camera I have. And right on top of it is a relatively a small navigation uh, system. It's not as accurate as the one I used before, but it's okay due to the cost problem. Uh, uh, it covers the 400 to 1,000 nanometer visible and near infrared range. This range is very important for monitor the plant health. And it gives me more than 270 spectral bands with a 2.2 nanometer spectral resolution. I used to fly it like a 50 meters height above the ground, and it can give me like 4 centimeters spectral resolution. So I will be able to distinguish each row by each row for the plot. Here are the, some data, I, preliminary data I have been collecting since this summer. <coughs> this is an alfalfa field at Arlington. I'm interested in using this uh, hyperspectral reflectance data to predict uh, alfalfa yield and also some nutritive qualities. Another data I have got is at the uh, Hancock potato. This, mm, so for this is a, a potato field, and the, the goal is to test uh, using different irrigation, uh, using uh, different irrigation rates to see the, if the water stress can affect the yield and also the potato quality. <coughs> different blocks have different irrigations. Another thing is this. At Arlington, at the cornfield, this is a GYE, genotype by environmental field. It has 1,600 plots. Each two row represents for one plot. So this high spatial resolution is very uh, helpful. Then I can visually actually distinguish row by row. And for this data, we are interested in predicting a bunch of different uh, phenotypes. That's something I'm currently working on. 
like of course definitely the, the adult season yield also like the stand pumps days to silking plant height year height um i probably couldn't get the plant height from this hyperspectral data but i can definitely do like green moisture and yield yeah that's something <coughs> for the field scale high resolution UAV based phenotyping. I'm also interested in working on the large scale. Uh, this is uh, work actually, um, <coughs> I'm currently working on to develop this yield prediction model using the deep learning and um, uh, satellite imagery. Here are the yield data we got from the NAS, USDA NAS is a public available this is for corn yield in 2018, and that's for, for soybean. We are targeting at the county level yield. Uh, we can use the uh, preceding years as the training data, then we forecasting yield for uh, later years. So why this is important? One thing is we can clearly see this yield tends to increase during the last 20 years, but uh, Within different years, there are big variation. We want to see if the model can quantify such variation. <coughs> we get some uh, input variables still, again, including the climate variable, uh, vegetation indexes from the satellite data. And here, we are interested not only in generate the uh, prediction values, prediction yield, that's only one value. We are also interested in quantifying if our the uncertainty of our prediction. So here we use uh, develop a Bayesian deep learning neural network for, for help tell us the uncertainty about our prediction. So this is uh, just preliminary results for 2016. By predicting 2016, I, we used the preceding years as the training and then passed on the 2016 data set. This is for core and for soybean. We get pretty good R square accuracy. And yeah, here are the uncertainty maps I mentioned earlier. So here are the counties. The corn and soybean mostly grow in this 12, 11 states corn belt. And we can see that at the boundary, at the border part, the uncertainty tends to be higher, but in the middle central part, the uncertainty tends to be lower. We haven't fully investigated into it, but the one thought is that uh, uh, the crop percentage within each county are different. Uh, that's uh, correlated to this uncertainty map. If this county has a lot of uh, crop cover, the uncertainty has to be lower uh, and vice versa. What interesting here is this, um, whatever the model we develop, we found that it's always either temporal specific or spatial specific. For example here, we use three states like Wisconsin, Indiana, or Illinois data to train the model. And if we still predict the data on these three states, it gives us this accuracy pretty good. But if we apply this model to other states, and then you see the accuracy is very low. So we call this location specific. It's the same for temporal. If we use this divide, predict this year, probably it's good. If we predict later years, then it becomes bad. To handle this issue, we tend to develop transport learning strategy to um, <coughs> to, to, to somehow align this, uh, we call these two domains, two domains together, and then to improve the accuracy on our target domain by using information from source domain. This is uh, undergoing uh, work we are still working on. Another work we just started is to use this satellite remote sensing data and machine learning to, to, mapping, to map the water quality. Here is the Lake Mendota. We can uh, get uh, like different water quality ground truth data from this LTER data set, it's public available. Then we can also access to the Landsat 7 using Google Earth Engine to, to <coughs> for, for the model development. And then we 
uh, using this satellite data and allow with climate information to develop some models to map the water quality. Yeah, just just mostly for my work. Uh, any questions? I think any questions. Time for questions. Yeah, the students who want to ask something first. Okay. We open it up then to anyone. Please. I have a question about sure. uh, uncertainty. That how did you capture the uncertainty? Did you use the Bayesian that you mentioned? That? Yes. So, Yes, I use a station and uh, we assume like a motion prior and then you can use the standard division sigma to quantify if the sigma is larger, the standard larger we think it's higher uncertainty. If it's very concentrated, uh, when we have this, it's lower uncertainty. Yeah, that's how we get it. So then actually the uncertainty maps here is the, the sigma, the motion standard. Um, I'm interested in the uh, nutrient, the nitrogen um, oh. fertilization work you did with the almonds in California. What are the prospects of doing something similar for corn uh, to predict in-season nutrient requirements based on yield prediction? Yeah, yeah, that's something I'm currently working on. It's not the corn, it's for alfalfa. For corn, it's uh, I have some. Yeah, this is for corn. We collect this uh, hyperspectral data. And then we can develop some in season yield prediction. We can predict yield weekly or monthly, predict the end of season yield. How, how early in the season do you get a good picture of what the yield is likely to be? How early? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I will try to collect all the data uh, during the growing season. Uh, I think probably we can. In May, we definitely can't predict very well, but I, uh, I think in July, probably we can get a good prediction accuracy. I don't know the answer yet. I'm still working on this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How scalable is this work to large areas? I mean, this work uh, used to be really interesting work. Right? Yeah. And we'd love to do this for every field, not just one field. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, given that you don't have all that hyperspectral observations over large areas, I, I'd like to you know, give you a feedback on how to scale these things. How to scale? <laughs> the UAV, the drone can only fly 20 minute, minutes for one set of battery, and it will cover like 10 acres. So I have two sets of battery in my lab now, so probably only 20 acres, then we have to recharge. Uh, if for the very, like the very large scale, probably we still have to use satellite or airborne system. That's what I said, yeah. I'm just wondering how you were defining sustainable agriculture or how, where the sustainability piece specifically fits in, if it's about approach or cropping or how you see that fitting in. Yeah, the sustainability, I would say we want to um, make more efficient use and leading to high productivity, but also reduce the environmental impacts. That's how I think. And then we, by using all this advanced technology, we predict this, predict that. The one thing is we want to reduce the farming. Help better, uh, develop a better uh, decision tool and let the growers to use such tools to manage their resources. That's one aspect, I think. The other aspect, I think, is we can continue exploring such biofuel crops. That's what I talk about, the phenotyping. Uh, yeah. In your uh, E versus uh, BTE, can you superimpose the available precipitation data and uh, the solar radiation data and see how strong the correlation is? Uh, with your E data, you didn't show the ambient conditions coincident ambient conditions. Okay. Yeah, I should start out. Yeah, no, I didn't. I just add all those data like variables into the model and then let that model itself to figure out. Yeah. In your uh, learning algorithm, uh. 
where from a big data you reduce to a selective smaller data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that dependent upon, does it also depend on the how fast the growth is for each of the grass types and uh, agricultural crop type so that you can, get, you can find what is the resolution needed in terms of collecting the data? Yeah. How did you arrive at that? The smaller data selection, what kind of a Oh. Reasoning that you use. Oh, the data dimensionality. I think you are talking about this thing. Yeah, the the training model. This, or this thing? No, the other one that you just showed. No, there you have your predictive and training, and you combine the two, the learning model. Oh, okay. This yeah, this one. Okay. You showed a combination of oh, right. two models, oh, and I'm curious of what oh, basis. Oh, I think you I did. think this one. Right? Yeah. Two, two things together, right? Okay. Yeah, I combined <coughs> the feature extraction part, this part. So we have input data from different sources coming, and uh, let's say 200 for each. We don't want to use this high-dimensional data. We don't want to process such high dimensional data. It's very <coughs> inefficient. I brings a lot of computational problems. And then first we do is to reduce the data dimensionality by using some feature extraction strategy. And then we can this instead of uh, reduce to a certain number of features for all the data together, we can target for different source. So we want to reduce this source to ten. We want to reduce this source to eleven or to seven. They can be different. And then with this reduce the features, then probably turn out to be 20, from 200 to 20. Then we combine this, use the models to for the final final prediction. Um, getting back to the question of uh, when you're predicting yield, um, is there a certain time in the year where the predictions no longer get much better? Yeah. Is there, a, is there a, and, and what I'm wondering is, is there is there an opportunity to incorporate like medium range forecasts <coughs> for climatic conditions to push that? Yeah, I, I really I think that's the problem. <coughs> the panel if we covered, we probably the hyperspectral data from now have too much useful information. And what you suggest can be definitely helpful to add us into the model development. <coughs> Is it, is it, does it appear like, does it appear that uh, weather conditions are particularly important at any time of the year? Or? Uh, for the weather condition, it's, uh, I use that for the large scale, mostly for the large scale yield prediction. For this small scale, I assume uh, for different clouds, because for the small scale, we target each cloud at each data sample point. We want to tell the difference, yield difference between different clouds. So I just assume within this small area, the temperature can be similar Yeah, but I mean, looking in terms of predicting yield, knowing something about the future temperature would be, might be useful. Yes, I think that can be very useful. Like, do we predict that yield changes based on the climate changes? Oh, like, 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 like 50 like years from now? That's what you... Yeah, that, yeah. Like a, that's something I'm super <laughs> interested in about that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh, no. I was thinking like a two-week forecast. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest in in in, uh, in our field in subseasonal to seasonal forecasting and pushing that out to two to, to six weeks. Oh. Okay. I just don't know. If I, I mean, there's there's two issues. One, there may not be any useful information in the, in the forecast uh, from just a meteorological standpoint, but also it may be that your system just isn't sensitive. So I was just wondering if there was any way of determining sensitivities to that. Oh, okay. I, I believe the model can help you with this range because as you do the prediction, we can extract uh, which the features are really high, yeah. more information. That's what I found. Yeah. Okay. How do you plan on developing your active learning policy? Oh, I want to develop an app tool so the farmer can use that once you 
take a picture and see how it goes. The model can tell you, okay, the next one you go there to collect the problem. Okay. But that's what I'm asking. How do you plan on developing the ability of the model to give a suggestion of what you're taking that sample? Uh, it depends on the application. So it's um, mm, so let's just use a yield, yield prediction. We get some uh, uh, ground truth sample from this area, and then the model needs to run online by using the app. And we run this algorithm, then the next round, the model can tell me where are the other locations are mostly informative. Then we just go to there to collect the cloud level yield. That's can you, I'm actually curious about that part too. Can you tell me a little bit more specifically about the algorithm in terms of how you select which training data okay. that you choose in that active version? Okay, I think sure, it's sure. kind of interesting. And, and I worry about how do you how do you get away from over training or you know essentially like yeah, mostly for active learning, we are interested in developing such a uh, query strategy. Uh, it's actually an iterative based uh, procedure. So initially, we start with a very small training data set to train on, to make predictions for all these unlabeled data points. Mm -hmm. And then we, here is how the uncertainty comes. We predict not only the values, but also the uncertainty. Okay. Then we choose the most uncertain samples and query their ground truth information and then add them into the training data to predict again. It's an iterative process. Each time we, we just add maybe 10 samples into the training data. That's how we collect feedback from the model. Like in the field, we initially we have only ground truth information from these several clouds. Okay. Then we train the algorithm, get some information, and then the algorithm can tell me if you want to improve the accuracy, which clouds you should go to collect the information instead of just Random. Based on some metrics. Yeah, 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 that's mm. what I... Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Any other questions on the front? What impact, if any, did you take field management practices into account? Field practice. Field management, management practices? Field management. Field. Field. For example, fertilizing, mm. you got your, you got your, uh, uh, your irrigation things in there that environment modifies this field in some way. You don't seem to have anything in the report that the micro record like this again. Right, uh, so one thing is one, um, the album work I worked on is for the nitrogen resource management. We want to know the yield, then this can be coupled with the nitrogen calculator. And for the irrigation, uh, for now, we just firstly need to know if there's a significant yield differences between different uh, irrigation systems. Then we can make a recommendation. That's, mm -hmm. if the, you mean the next year, if the distribution changes next year, and how it will be the same. Well, yeah, exactly. yeah, because you then the field will mod be modified. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something we can use the transfer learning is I think. That's, that's how it works. Then in the next year, instead of just still collecting all this ground truth information, we can use transfer learning to, to, to apply the model we developed based on this year's ground truth data and to still get good prediction accuracy for the next year. Then we can help save farmers time together. So Back here. Yeah. So how does the work that you're doing compare to what a company like Farmers Business Network does for farmers? Are you familiar with that Farmers Business Network? It takes, set, I mean, farmers are subscribers and they, it takes satellite data. I'm not totally sure, but I know it provides a lot of information to farmers. I was just curious if there are companies that are interested in the work you're doing and incorporating it into the services that they're already providing to farmers. Okay, so uh, <coughs> yeah, the, the all, all this approach will automatic goal is to uh, let farmer use the tool we, we develop. Um, one thing is I'm interested in uh, generate the yield prediction map for the large scale um, for different regions. Probably we can uh, that that can predict yield ma monthly. We can give this uh, yield prediction map monthly. 
Another thing is, uh, I think we can use it. We, we divide such high resolution UAV based phenotyping tool, but it's super expensive. Probably farmers couldn't afford them. We can, but <coughs> along with the computational algorithm, we can just use them as a service to help farmers make it. Mm -hmm. okay, that's what I think. Um, one more, I guess. Okay. Uh, you've got your feature, feature interactions. Uh, what, do you, what machine learning algorithm do you use? Let me go ahead and make your video the model. Oh, just different algorithms. For some use deep learning neural networks, some use ensemble models, some use SVM, just different algorithms we can test out. Yeah. Well, let's give our speaker another hand. out more about machine learning or precision ag or climate variability or you just want to hang out with folks from, from CPR and elsewhere then please come over to the set in a few minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, first, second floor supper I think first. Mm -hmm. Finally. <laughs>